Hello, welcome to Movers, Shakers, Designers, Makers. I'm Steve Carpenter. I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Architecture at Penn State. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Penn State alumnus, John Hoke, Chief Design Officer at Nike. John is a 1988 Bachelor of Architecture graduate and has been recognized twice by Penn State for his professional accomplishments. First in 2003 with an alumni award from the College of Arts and Architecture, and following that in 2008, John was awarded the lifelong designation of alumni fellow by the Penn State Alumni Association. Welcome, John. Thank you for your willingness to take time today and share your story with us. Thanks, Steve. It's great to be here. Um, I've gotten to know you over the course of the last few months and um, always enjoyed our conversation. So thank you so much for the chance to be with you and, and your total audience. You're welcome. Thank you for, for accepting. Uh, it's it's uh, good to have you here. Look, John, I'm, I'm grateful that, um, you know, over the course of this past year, um, which has been my first year as dean of the college, uh, like you said, you and I have had several great conversations about a range of topics. Um, but the main focus uh, of our time together today uh, is to provide an opportunity for followers of this interview series uh, to get to know you and to learn a little bit about your career tra trajectory. Uh, sure. And of course, uh, you know, we're also going to take a look back at your time at Penn State. Okay. I can't wait. Yeah, that, it's been, you know, this, Steve. So you and I, I, I want to say this was early spring, began um, just a cold, a cold call, in essence. And I think it was scheduled for like 30 minutes. And I think we probably went 90 minutes in and I, mm -hmm. we got done and I said, man, I just found a new friend. Yeah. So you and I've had these conversations, which have been, you know, mutually beneficial, but I want to thank you for your ear and your friendship, because it's been helpful through um, all that is 2020. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you saying that. I, uh, I I remember that first call and the, the time just dissolved. Uh, I don't know where it went. It was the, one of the most easy, cold phone calls I've ever made. And I haven't made many of them, but... Um, we, we chatted like we've, we've chatted uh, a number of times before. So uh, I appreciate your friendship too. Um, uh, and to, to schedule those calls and to, um, to know, hey, you know, ne next week I get to talk to John. Uh, there was one week that it really helped me to get through that week knowing, okay, John's at the end of the week, we get to talk. That, 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 uh, that, that helped me through. So thanks. Well, let, let's, let's start um, uh, and, and, and go back a bit. Um, so, you know, I, I need to, reiterate that you, you left Penn State with an undergraduate degree in architecture. Uh, yeah. And then you went to the University of Pennsylvania and earned your master's degree. Um, what was your first job after graduate school, John? After graduate school or undergrad? Yeah. Uh, okay, let's, let's go there. What was your first job after undergraduate? Yeah. So after undergrad, I mm -hmm. went to work for an architect in Princeton, New Jersey named Michael Braves. And if I think back uh, on my, my last year, my thesis year, my fifth year at Penn State in the School of Architecture, you know, those were, um, those were challenging times because you're kind of getting ready to conclude your own investigations, your coursework, et cetera, and you're about to uh, enter the world, right? So at, at the time of the late 80s, there, you know, there was lots of work to be had. And, and I had um, a great intention to want to take my education and the things that I had studied and learned and apply those to a specific um, set of criteria to get to an office that I felt would challenge me. And at the time, um, one of the leading designers and architects in the world was a gentleman named Michael Graves. Um, he is a forefather of postmodernism. He was teaching in Princeton and had a wonderful practice in Princeton. And the office was about 45 people strong. So throughout my fifth year, I, uh, I have the, the dubious honor of sending a countless, probably half a dozen resumes and differently worded cover letters about my desire to be employed by Michael Graves. And uh, like clockwork, I would receive the pre-typed no thank you message back from the office. And so I, I have I actually have saved all of those. Um, I'll share that in a second. In the second semester, 
very early on, there was a, uh, a bulletin board that was outside of our studios. And on the bulletin board, I recognized the letterhead, which said Michael Graves Architect, and they were seeking to hire um, a model maker. And I said, that's going to be my job. I took down the information, began to make my contact. I reached out again with a letter, several annoying phone calls. I was pretty persistent. And lo and behold, I got an interview. And this interview came very, very closely to the end of my thesis year. So I was burning the candle at both ends, so to speak. I had decided to bring examples of my model making ability and then also make two physical models to bring down to his office. So I drove um, all morning, got down to his office in Princeton, about a six hour drive. I met with, the, at the time, the one of the chief designers and the head of the office, and I landed this job. <laughs> and it was um, quite something for me. It was quite an achievement to be able to put this out there and go get this done. So I ended up graduating uh, with my thesis project, and I, I did you know nice work at the school and spent about uh, two weeks between graduating and starting in, in Michael Graves' office in Princeton. Um, so when I got there, um, his office was just overflowing with work, Steve. It was a crazy time. It was 1988. He was the, the darling of postmodernism. Absolutely. And everybody yeah. who's anybody was putting a project through his office. So I quickly learned that the job that I thought I had was different than the job that I actually had. Uh, I worked... It Seven days. Worked, I was going to say it works out that way sometimes, right? That there's a, there's the lure and then there's the reality, right? There was, yeah. 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 And I I think I was the 47th person hired, and I just started uh, on a Monday, and I quickly learned that we worked seven days a week, and we worked almost around the clock, just because of the pace of the studio and the amount of work that was uh, coming through his office at the time, and. He was known for these beautiful three-dimensional cardboard models, which is what I was hired to do. And it was myself and a, a few others, I think three at the maximum. So I was really busy. <laughs> but I did come to learn that there was a pecking order at the office. And the pecking order was something like this. You've got Michael Graves, the Princeton professor, uh, founder of his studio, the senior principals and the partners, and then the senior associates and associates. The, ar the architects and the designers and the job captains. And then it was like the gardener and the plumber. And then the model maker was right down here. in the strata. <laughs> So, you know, my, my job was to make uh, these models for folks to look good so that the products uh, or the projects got through. And what was amazing was um, as tough as that was, I sat six feet away from him at his desk for a year because that was the pace. So I got to sit next to an American master for that amount of time. Wow. And I very quickly learned what he liked and didn't like and would approve and not approve and how to push and pull some of the form vocabulary and the massing studies that he did. About a year into my career, he looks up and says, you're an architect, right? <laughs> I said, yeah. He goes, well, why don't you go upstairs? Uh, we need more architects to do some work for us. And I said, excellent, I'll do that. So I took that role as a model maker and I moved upstairs to where the design studios were and I at the tender age of 23 was doing private residences and uh, helping on corporate headquarters, doing uh, products, graphics, events, trade shows, retail stores uh, very quickly because there was just so much work. So I had this crash course uh, very quickly moving from somebody who was building cardboard models to somebody who was designing and building in the real world. So that was a wonderful way to start my career. That's amazing. And it's, it's not like, um there's a script for that, right? There's not like, you study this, you can then instantly work with Michael Graves and then you instantly move up stairs to architecture uh, space. Uh, th there's a lot of persistence there. I mean, you know, you tried and tried and tried and tried and, um, it, it, you know, you in, end up in the, in, in the place where you need to be, but it's, um, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's, to me, it, it, it suggests um, uh, th there's a characteristic that you carry about the persist there's the persistence piece, right? And um, I'm, I'm remembering that some of the conversations we've had earlier um, about uh, you know uh, uh, your 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 career, uh, and, and we've talked about things that I've done. But 
Um, you, know, you, you and I've shared some wonderful uh, stories and conversations and I love, there's one story that I love in particular, I guess it's the next, next iteration. Um, and I think it, it's, it was about uh, when you were a, a teenager uh, and, and uh, you, you know, uh, you were, uh, uh, I mean, this gets us to, to the shoe design part of the, the conversation, sure. obviously. I mean, we had to get there at some point. Uh, sure. yeah. uh, and, you know, and, and it's, it's, you know, and I'm, I'm moved by what you did uh, with the idea uh, when, when you were uh, a, a teenager and uh, uh, shoe design. So you've, you, I know you've told this story millions of times, uh, but for those folks who, who are watching and, and aren't familiar with the story, could, could you share that story with me, please? Sure, yeah. Thanks. That, that story um, predates Penn State and predates Michael Graves. Um, so I always begin that story, Steve, I think as you recall by uh, saying that I am dyslexic. And so I, I've had dyslexia as a boy and as a young man and now as an older man all of my life. And um, dyslexia is something that I don't believe is a curse. I believe it's been a blessing in my life. Um, not always. And I recognize that I've had certain privileges to help me overcome my learning disabilities. But I anchor back on that because it begins this story. So at a very young age, um, I struggled uh, in grade school with reading and writing. And I had a real challenge with the mechanics of these things. And I had parents who were fortunate enough to help me understand um, through some, some, some investigations and some studies that I had dyslexia and understand what that actually meant. So what that means to me is the mechanics of using my eyes, my optical nerve to my brain, to my comprehension is, is slower than, um, than most folks. So the workaround that I had and the crutch that I built at a tender young age, I'm talking three, four, five, was I picked up a crayon and then a pencil and then a pen. And I like to say that drawing is my native tongue. It's my first true language. It's the way I understand the world. For me to really understand something, I have to draw it. And it's investigatory and soothing simultaneously. It's just the way that I, my brain works. So going through grade school and struggling with the, the basics of reading and writing, but always falling back on art and, and the mechanics of drawing was helpful. And I had the other, that was one of the bookends of my life. The second bookend was, I was a pretty active young kid. And as a boy, I was a pretty decent athlete. And these two bookends were kind of helping me to understand myself, the challenges that I faced, and to find a level of confidence that would grow over time uh, to help me navigate, negotiate the world that was not designed for a dyslexic man. Um, and as the story goes, um, when I was 10, 11, 12 years old, I did two things. I used to draw everything I could think of. So think cars, buildings, and sneakers, because I was a, um, I was a pretty good runner as a kid, and I was a track uh, rabbit for the older boys that used to run varsity. And a rabbit is basically a young kid that sprints as far and as fast as they can, and it pulls the pack along. And so the older kids would chase you down and sort of tap you on the head and you fall aside. And I happened to notice that all these boys were wearing um, Nike waffle trainers, which was a, a great Nike shoe back in the 70s. And so at night, I would, you know, get these um, pens and papers together, and I would kind of cut my shoes in half and study the sections and just keep drawing over and over again. True story, one summer, uh, I was 12 years old. I was floating on a raft in a pool and I was just daydreaming about, well, I wonder if I could shrink this raft and strap it to my foot and that could become um, a cushion between my body, my foot and the ground. And I went home that night and the next couple of days and I drew these blueprints, if you will, of a raft under my foot or an air cushioning system under my foot. I showed this to my father who was an engineer and he said, well, what do you want to do with this? And I brought it in a big orange box and I said, I want to send it to this company. It's Nike. It's the shoes that I like to run in. <laughs> and uh, before the internet, there was something called a library. You know, it's a physical building kids. You'd have to go to it. It has books. It has books. Yeah. Real books, things you crack yeah. open. And I researched, um, you know, who owned this company? And I came to learn it was Phil Knight. So I wrote a letter to Phil Knight 
as a 12 year old boy in the late seventies and said, I have an idea and I've enclosed these blueprints that are bringing an air cushioning system underfoot. Put it in the mail, didn't think anything of it. About three weeks later, a letter in a box show up at my house. And <laughs> the letter I have hanging in my office, uh, dated 1979, in essence, the company writes me back and says, really cool idea. Um, like what you're thinking about, you know, in close, please find a t-shirt and a pair of sneakers and some advertisement stuff we're doing. And when you get old enough, you should come work for us. I'm 12 years old, Steve. Right. So that was a pretty indelible moment. And I won't call it destiny, but certainly I filed that back in the brain of, hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> in fact, I got this, I'll share this with you. I hope this is okay. This is a, an image my father sent me. This is me as a kid. Can you see yeah, that? I yeah. can. Yeah. That's a great tenor. See those sneakers? I do. Those are the ones. Oh, that, my. Yeah, waffle trainers. So, um, <laughs> As the story goes, I left Michael Graves' office. I went back to get my uh, master's degree at the University of Pennsylvania. Thoroughly enjoyed my uh, year out and began my search for the next career, the next job. And I was home one um, weekend and sort of unearthed this letter in my childhood bedside table. And there was not a lot of architecture work to be had in 1992. So I just said, I'm gonna give this a shot. Reached out to the company with a then head of design. I was giving a lecture to the undergrads about health imagery and architecture. They, they sent me some slides of some of the Nike work they were doing. I returned the slides with a letter and began a correspondence, just like with Michael Graves. Every week, every two weeks, a letter, a phone call. <laughs> sure enough, uh, I finally got an interview. And um, I flew out to Nike and I had my portfolio. I had graduated doing some consultancy work in Philadelphia. And I brought my portfolio out to now the, um, the executive chair of our company, who was the head of design. And I went through my portfolio. And at the end of the portfolio, I pulled out that letter. And I said, I'm here today to redeem the coupon you sent me in 1979. That's the part. There it is. And he there said, OK. I, I flew back home, uh, took the red eye back, went back to work, got a phone call two days later, and was hired in 1992. And I've been at Nike. Uh, working in design, innovation, and creativity since 1992. I love that story, man. <laughs> yeah. I love that story. You know, to share your idea with the CEO of a company, of Nike, I mean, this, come on, man. Tell me, where did you get the confidence? Where, where, where did that inspiration come from? And, and where do you find your confidence and inspiration now? Well, I, I think um, the answer to both those questions is, there's a wellspring within me that is restlessly curious about wanting to have an impact and, and wanting to make change. So even at a young age, um, I just believe I ideas need to get out, <laughs> even if they're wrong. And um, I had always been willing to risk putting myself out there and seeing what happened. And, you know, Stephen, you and I have talked about this before. This story sounds rosy. I've had plenty of failures in my life and it's not the thing, I don't necessarily celebrate all the failures, but the response to those failures, getting up, getting back to it, getting back to the drawing board, getting back a foot in front of you. Th those are the things that I'm most proud of myself in my career. Cause I've, I've taken, you know, like most of us have taken a series of failures and, um, and those inspire me. But, you know, today, um, like, like always, my motivation is I just want to have a big impact uh, creatively. I, I want to see what problems can be solved and, and can I either do or coax or lead or inspire some of those solutions so that they make us better. They, they change our world for the better. Changing the world for the better. Making, making a positive change in the world. That's where the inspiration comes from. Um, what did you, you said, uh, what was the sentence you used a few minutes ago? Um, the ideas to, need to get out even if they're wrong. I mean, that takes a lot of confidence, but it also suggests to me that there are ideas. I mean, you, you're so, I don't wanna say that you're so uh, uh, filled with, with ideas that, that they just kind of ooze out, but maybe that's, that's what it is. Like how, how, does, how do the ideas, um, 
uh, surface or, or, or is, is it like, okay, today I have, I know I have my list of 10 ideas, those are coming out or do they, they formulate, they kind of morph, they, they grow and, and emerge. I'm, I'm interested in that, that iterative process of ideas before they are actually birthed or released uh, in, into the world. Yeah. You know, I am too, Steve. And um, I will tell you that being a designer, as, as I've mentioned, most of my life, um, my days and my emotions dwell in the economy of ideas. That's just what we do. That's what, that's mm -hmm. what I do. And um, I'm, I'm attuned to scanning the world with wide-eyed wonder and having this um, joyful approach of what I see, but that's counterweighted with a healthy disrespect for the status quo of what can we improve on? What can we make mm -hmm. better? And it's, it's those two things that I think have, have helped me. Um, I'm oftentimes asked about, well, hey, what, where do these ideas come from? And, and I'm, I'm fond of saying that ideas never present themselves in full form or as a solution. They present themselves as an abstraction. You have to pay attention to the things that are in front of you. And your job as a creative is to find the tendrils between the dots to figure out how you connect certain things together to create something of meaning, of value, something new. Um, and I also, in my age now, mid fifties is, I have to be attuned to when these ideas come. You know, I was recently speaking to someone and I said, my, my dream state is interesting now because I, I have active dream state and I oftentimes will get up in the middle of the night and like, I've got an idea and I have a, an iPad and I have a sketch pad next to me. And there are nights when I, I'm up and I have something that something has fired in my mind that I have to get on paper or get down. And um, they're not always right. They're not always good, but they're, they're there. And so I have to, I've recognized that I have to capture them because they, um, they'll go away. And I don't, sometimes I, I'll fight for years trying to re reclaim something <laughs> that I had. And uh, whether I'm physically active, think at this point, yoga, running, biking, et cetera, or out for a walk, I always carry my phone and my sketchbook because I want to capture these ideas. I feel like if I'm moving my body, um, it helps me not have an idle mind. So um, just pay attention. That's what I think. It's you, We have these intuitions. We have these feelings. And they're not always right. But occasionally, things surface that are important. And if you pay attention to those things and you connect those things, because they are abstractions, your job as a creative is to winnow those down, to really focus those into a solution. That that excites me today. I'm wondering if um, in, you mentioned your dyslexia, uh, whether the um, uh, because you're not necessarily your relationship with with written words. Um, uh, might require a particular uh, uh, form of attention that moving into an abstraction, you you think with the drawing piece of it, you're, you're, the, the ideas come to you in, in these other ways. You're experiencing and dealing with the world in embodied ways and in symbolic ways that, as you said, this, you, you know, some people might frame dyslexia in, in a particular way. You say, no, this is actually a, a mode for me to open up other possibilities. I'm trying to make that shift. Is that maybe you're, you freed up in, in some ways um, and it opens you up in this other way of learning and experiencing the world where a written uh, formal, or not formal, but a written um, uh, a, a approach to documenting or written approach to communicating um, because there's, you, know, you have a particular relationship with that form of communication, this other one becomes enhanced. Uh, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to work out this relationship in real time. I, I'm, I'm not putting the words together well, but I'm thinking that can, can you talk to me about the, this this relationship? Is do you see something? Am I hitting on something here, or is this sure. Steve making stuff up uh, in in real time that, that is completely incoherent? No, not at all. I, it, um, the way I would pitch that back to you is, life is funny. It, it presents things to all of us in ways that, again, if we're paying attention, um, there's a path forward. And I think with dyslexia, it had become the paradox of adversity these are the challenges that you face and you're going to find 
workarounds and you're going to find other ways of thinking of absorbing of processing and i i do think steve the the way that i process information um in the reading the written word what I've, has been described to me is the pace of my eyes reading is too slow my i'm always my eyes are ahead and i think the uh the best way that i take in information is highly visual and i i like to think i have a pretty good visual memory of uh, form vocabulary and compositional um, studies, etc. So I have a visual recall that's pretty good. And that's just, that's a great workaround for me. So it, it helps me put different things together, things that would be not, I'll say obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, that's, that's helpful. That's helpful. I'm, I, and I'm, you know, I've said this to you before. I'm, um, I'm glad, actually. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't wish any other mind. <laughs> I'm mm -hmm. really, I'm happy with um, with what I've got, and and the challenges of what I have have helped me be who whom I am, and I think you know to your audience, um, I think creativity is is a wonderful thing to possess. It's uniquely human. You know, the human imagination is probably the most powerful calculus we have, and in the world that we live in today, you know, there will be lots of I'll call it intelligences that will be done algorithmically and through calculus. What will not be, I, I think, I suspect, will not be replaced is the illogical, nonsensical, playful, joyful, creative acts. There's no binary calculus that I'm aware of that does that. So, you know, for your audience, it, it's great to be a creative mind. It, the world needs way more creativity. <laughs> Uh, and that will counterbalance the efficiency, the, the calculus that's out there. So I always encourage, you know, students and parents to embrace the, the human act of creativity, because I think that's what's going to be left when it's all said and done. I, I agree with you. I agree. Um, you know, I, I will uh, meet uh, parents of young children who, who love to draw or, or love to, to build things with Legos, let's say, but particularly like drawing or, or painting, or even um, uh, parents or, or guardians of, of, of older kids and um, uh, who are interested in art. And they say, oh, you're, a, you're an art professor. Um, uh, what, uh, what advice do you have? What can I do to help, help them? I say, give them materials yes. and, and get out of their way. Let them let them explore, let them expand, let them um, um, uh, be curious as, as, as you were talking about uh, and, and be creative. That's what it's about, making sure that you normalize that kind of behavior because that's the way that they are processing the world. That's the way in which they're making sense of the world. That's the way in which they are um, um, in, engaging with, with ideas and thoughts. So um, uh, the best way to help is to, to not be an obstacle, but to, but to be a support. Um, that, that's, that's um, I, I spend lots of time, Steve, talking to young kids and students and, and occasionally some parents as well. And I'm always asked, well, what do I do? And I, my response is exactly what you have just said. Please nurture their gift. Don't <laughs> help them run towards this creative future. I, mm -hmm. Again, I, it's not just the, the role that I have or the vocation that I've chosen. I, I just think that's what's going to be left. You know, you think about the power of artificial intelligence and where that's taking us um, and, and how much of a surrogate and how much autonomy we'll pick up um, with computational power. Today, the human imagination, human creativity cannot be. And again, I think we face incredible problems sitting here in 2021 and we're going to need ingenuity, <laughs> imagination, creativity to get us to get us forward. Um, I don't think there's binary calculus that's going to solve the problems that we face. I, I agree. I agree. Um, John, let's let's shift to another uh, li line of thought here. Um, and it, it, uh, you have been with Nike since '92 or 1993, I think. Uh, can you share a bit about how your role with Nike has evolved over the years? You know, I like to use the analogy, Stephen, that when I was brought in 1992, uh, I, albeit I was young, I was 27, 28 years old, um, 
the company paid me to make lightning strikes, right? I used my pen to do things that um, I physically was designing and that, that would come out and I'd look at it. It was a building, it was a trade show, it was a graphic, it was a website, it was a sneaker, a shirt, et cetera. And as I transitioned to my leadership role, I recognized that my job was no longer about lightning strikes, but about creating the conditions for lightning for other designers to have great moments. And that was a transition. And I recognized that my creative duties and my responsibilities could have a broader impact, not left to what I could physically do myself, but what could I inspire and how could I coax others to be a part of this larger brand ethos that we have. Uh, you know, I'm also struck, John, uh, I think I mentioned this to you um, in an earlier conversation that we had that um, there's not necessarily a, a playbook for you to, to learn how to move from a, a, a person within a, a, a group who are, who's being su supervised by someone, and then you move to a larger group and the larger, and then at, at a certain point you are supervising a large number of people. There's not a playbook necessarily to help walk you through that. You had to also evolve um, and and uh, uh, create your own awareness of how to how to lead and and how to work with uh, other people. Can, can you say a few things about how, how that happened? Uh, and, you know, I, I kind of go back to my um, experiences as a, a younger man um, in high school and playing sports and you know being a uh, quarterback and being a captain of teams, et cetera, and playing basketball and knowing how to play a role. And, but no, if I, if I went back to my 18 year old self and I said, this is what you're going to do, I'd have to pinch myself because, you know, I'm inherently uh, shy because it's just the, the nature of who I am. So the thought of me leading a thousand creatives and leading, um, a discourse of a company like Nike on the world stage of design would have been unfathomable to me as a as a young person. But, you know, I think as is our nature, it's, you know, you, you evolve and you grow and you, you, you try to face these challenges with as much um, grace and intention as you can. And when you fail, you are kind to yourself, you learn from those failures, and you move on. Uh, and that's, that's been really helpful to me. You know, I, I have this, this um, meditation that I, the company knows, I use this often. I say, I believe in my, in my bones that it's, I focus on progress, not perfection. I think perfection is a trap. And if I'm making progress, and progress is not linear, right? It, it, there's lots of bumps in the road. But if I, if I make progress and I keep learning, um, we'll be okay. I'll, I'll be okay. And the other thing I think is to, to recognize that you have to balance your confidence with your own humility, right? So I often say that um, I don't presume to know a lot, Steve. I'm really curious. And I, I welcome the day with, hmm, what's the day going to bring? And I, I believe I live with a bit of a wide-eyed wonder of what's going on, what, what's happening. And I, as long as that I possess that mindset, um, things have worked out. And, and when I have, you know, failures and, and setbacks, um, that, that gets me going, you know, it keeps, keeps me going, I should say. I'm imagining, you know, when you talk to students, uh, and I know, know you've worked with students at, uh, at Penn State and, and other institutions, um, what advice uh, do you find yourself giving them often about a skill set or a mindset, um, or even personal characteristics, some of the things that we've talked about here? Um, what, what advice do you give them in that space that could help them succeed um, in, in their own pursuits? Yeah, it was a great question, Stephen. You know, I, I do, I get a chance to teach young kids and it's, it's actually thrilling. It keeps me uh, young and exploring. Um, you know, what I always say is the most powerful tool we possess as designers is not necessarily a skill set, it's the ability to ask questions, right? And do not accept what's given to you at face value and hold the healthy disrespect for the status quo mm -hmm. and be ready and willing to challenge convention because convention is not always right. It's, it's just what's happened. So I, I think that's a, an important lesson. Um, I, I always tell the students that I work with that the mechanics and the skills are gonna come and go. They're gonna keep evolving. It's the traits that you, 
you possess as a creative that stay with you, that the trait of curiosity is incredibly important. The, the trait of agility and adaptability, incredibly important because the students in your audience today, who knows what changes you're gonna face? Who knows what problems you're going to face? I can guarantee you this, the solutions won't be what you have today. They'll be completely different. And if you can apply those creative traits and your unwavering commitment to those, you can, you can learn new skills, you can learn new tool sets, you can learn new problems, you can learn new industries. Um, and it's the application of your traits, your creative traits that will be most important to you. I yeah. use my career as an example. I was trained as an architect. I don't possess an architectural license. Uh, I've built many buildings, um, but I've built a lot of other things. And I wasn't trained to do that. But at Penn State, I was trained <laughs> critical creative thinking. And the application of that critical creative thinking can be a myriad of problems in front of me. You're, you're talking about verbs, John. You're, you're not talking about the nouns and getting fixated on, on the nouns and the things and the finite and the absoluteness of things. You're talking about, when you talk about processes, when you're talking about progress, when you're talking about um, concepts, uh, to me, you're talking about verbs. It's the actions and, 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 and putting those, the, the conceptual understandings mm -hmm. into actions in, in different contexts, in different ways that would require you to, again, back to you know, this idea of evolving or, or uh, being curious. Asking questions is a verb. Uh, that right, it, it, it's in that space of, of the action and, and, and the doing uh, and, the, and the reflective. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I guess in my career and my education and um, the people that inspire me, we're always in pursuit. So there's no finish line. Um, you don't turn off creativity. You turn it on and up, and and that is a verb, right? It, it's the application of that can be deployed pretty much anywhere. So that to me is exciting. Yeah, no, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, little shift. Um, you know, I can't, um, we can't have this conversation without acknowledging that we're actually chatting in early December of, of 2020. This, this will be, you know, shared with the world in, in uh, 2021, but you know, it makes me wonder about how uh, you folks at Nike have managed to continue to work uh, and, and do what you do. Uh, I, I know and have a good sense of what we do here in the university and how we move teaching and, and other and, and forms of work uh, online. But how do you do that at, at Nike? How do you move an operation that to me seems there's a lot of tactile or tangible engagement, interpersonal relationships? How do you move that to a Zoom space? Uh, what, what's that like? Well, Steve, I mean, it's been one of the greatest challenges of my, my professional career and probably in my life. Um, today in, in December of 2020, I'm sitting at my, my offices, the corporate headquarters of Nike in Beaverton, Oregon, which is oh, seven miles to the west of downtown Portland, Oregon, where I have my home with my wife and, and, and young boys. Mm -hmm. And um, What's amazing to me is that I'm sitting here on the campus that usually houses 25,000 people. And I'm going to say I'm probably eight, nine people on the campus today. So in the early innings of the pandemic, um, we began, like I think most institutions, the gradual um, reduction of time physically, ultimately to the complete lockdown in the state of Oregon and the county of uh, Washington where we sit with our company. And you know, for the first, I'll say month, we were scrambling to find a way to uh, retain our creative ability. And you know, I'm, I'm really, I sit here today in December and I'm, I'm grateful for some of the challenges that we were thrown in 2020, because I think it's helped us grow. I think it has helped us face some of the challenges that we knew were coming and it accelerated the way we wanted to work. Um, doesn't mean it's easy. So, you know, from a creative group, again, think a thousand designers quickly moving technology from our world headquarters 
two home offices. Think about our, um, our meetings, which are all in person and, and quite lively and quite large, becoming all Zoom-based. And getting our staff the skills and the tools and the experiences to feel comfortable um, being creative in this, this digital environment. And, you know, I'm really happy to tell you that what I've learned is that creativity will not be quarantined now or ever. That sounds like a good t-shirt slogan, John. <laughs> <laughs> you and me, buddy. <laughs> Great like that one. Um, you know, I've, I've just found the resilience uh, and the reservoirs of creativity have actually grown, <laughs> surprisingly, because of the constraint and because of the the, the absence of um, the ability to congregate together. And even though you and I have not met, Steve, you know, I feel this format, whilst on the one hand, I can't stand, and on the other hand, I'm, I'm quite grateful for it because it's an intimate peek into you and, and you into I. We, we, I, know your, I, know your, I know your room. I know your, <laughs> you know, by extension, I know your family, et cetera. And um, it, it demands we focus uh, in the moment, which I think is great. You know, the, the, the downsides for us as creatives and designers is we've become a bit touch blind. And what I mean is in, in my world, um, I, I think I'm kind of a sculptor and I sculpt through other people because my job is to put things on bodies, right? It's dimensional and, mm -hmm. and because it's dimensional um, and we design to employ all senses. So the way a garment fits and feels in the hand and the on the body, et cetera, the weight of a shoe, the flexibility, the dynamic stretch. I have a real hard time, you know, judging and looking and critiquing that online. I've gotten better <laughs> to articulate it well, but um, I, I think what I'm missing is in, in my career, in my time pre-COVID was the happy accidents of just being in the moment together and seeing things that were unplanned come to life and making choices based on those unplanned creative moments. Um, and the way that we operate today with Zoom and other technologies, it, it's very planful. So I really do hope that when we cross back over that we learn a thing or two about this environment and we kind of go back to the, I'll call it the hands-on, the analog approach to designing with our fingertips. Yeah, I hear you. Um, you know, it, um... I'm I'm thankful as well for this this medium uh, to as a, as a mode to get to know you uh, uh, and uh, uh, but you know there are elements that I mean so so if you and I were sitting around a table right now and having this conversation it might be possible that at some point I'd have to pull my phone over my glasses and and show you something uh, kind of symbolically to help explain what I'm talking about and. It, it's tough to do that. I'd have to hold them up. You know, there's certain um, spontaneous ways that we communicate interpersonally yeah. in this in the same space that we we just can't we can't do this way. So I, I hear you about um, those frustrations, but at the same time, um, those challenges set up new ways of thinking, new new possibilities. Right? You have to then, as you're saying, you know, you tap into it, um, and and other ways uh, emerge. Um, and, and and this environment, this online environment. Um, Obviously, uh, you know. So, if, so if we think about an environment, let's let's think about the environment of the the social and, and cultural environment now, at at, at the moment, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the U.S. presidential election was about a month ago. Um, you know, of course, the nation and the world were all engaged in thinking about um, protests of, of various kinds, uh, responses to police brutality, uh, racial injustice, uh, violence of, of various sorts. Um, you know, the pandemic, of course, is 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 either uh, uh, amplifying some of this or or um, 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 highlighting some of it. Um, climate change debates. You and I talked about climate change. Uh, one of our previous uh, uh, conversations. Economic uncertainty. I mean, I, I could, could go on, right? I mean, yeah. not that these things aren't always at play, but there's something about 2020 that has put a spotlight, a particular kind of spotlight, on these issues. So, um, I'm curious if you uh, about uh, what, what you would say about the current social and cultural moment, uh, what, what, is it, what does it mean to you? We, we've talked a bit about it previously, but um, here for this, this context, what does the current social and cultural moment mean to you? Well, I think um, to, to begin where you dropped off, I think we, these are unprecedented times 
And um, I oftentimes would think back about what has happened as being unwelcomed, unwarranted and unwanted. And I think about the, the layers and the stacks of trauma that, that all of us have faced, not just in this nation, but across the world. And for whatever reason, 2020 has presented itself as a moment of deep reflection. And it's been forced by maybe mother nature and the virus hitting the pause button. And that pause button having a series of um, corresponding events and with the time and the focus and the traumas making us um, see things differently, if you will, inviting a different conversation, albeit at times extremely uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, I think we'll look back at this moment and we will, I hope, have said that um, it was a pivot and it was a shift and there was a, uh, a communal learning that happened and it wasn't easy and it was overdue and it changed the way we thought about ourselves, about each other, about the world around us. You know, I, I've been thinking about this, Steve, and, and you and I have talked about this in different calls in different ways, but the one thing that designers possess, uh, I think in, in buckets full is this idea of empathy. You know, as a designer, you have to have empathy because you're, you're using your creative skills to solve somebody else's problems. And that, that empathy is growing in 2020, I hope. And that empathy is, in my humble opinion, the, oh, let, me, let me back up. The idea that we need to invite diversity and differences to our tables creates and should create an empathy, a desire to know more. You're different than I am. That's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. I seek to understand more. That empathy, I believe, is the mother's milk of curiosity. Curiosity is the backbone of creativity. Creativity leads to innovation. Innovation leads to progress and change. So this is a moment where we can invite difference, welcome it in, in all of its discomfort and all of its potential. And if we use it the right way, we're all gonna be better for it. It, it will take everyone, Stephen, as we talked about, this is not a particular audience. This is all of us sitting in this discomfort and trying to find a path forward together and being able to, as best we can, push through and make progress for, for every community that we serve. And key there is it's not going to be comfortable or easy because if it is comfortable or easy to turn that page and move forward collectively together for the better, uh, for a better outcome, uh, and possibilities for all of us, it would have happened a while ago. Use the word, it's overdue. Absolutely. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. And back to a, one of our words about, pro, you know, we've used previously progress mm -hmm. or a process or verb. This is not a toggle switch. It's not going to be a flick of the, of the switch. Mm -hmm. And I think um, for all of the um, technology, uh, you and I have talked a bit about our, our interest in, uh, contemporary technologies, um, uh, you know, the, the immediacy of texting is done, right? I mean, there's an immediacy that we're kind of used to, but important social change or important interpersonal um, benef beneficial outcomes are not going to be instantaneous. They will take time. And it's a, it's a, there's a, there's a process there. Um, yeah. I, I, we've said this, I mean, and, and this is true in our solutions at Nike, some of the, the largest challenges that we face as designers are um, existential. Technology, while great, has led to isolation and deprivation and polarization. And so all those things pull us apart pull us versus bringing us together. And I guess the best news is we're, we're in control of our technologies as of today. And we get to, um, to point those 
in the direction of keeping us human and fighting through some of those villains of, of, of creative outlets, right? Yeah. We, we don't want to be isolated. We, we want to find ways to relate and we want to be kinder. We want to uh, be able to congregate and be able to challenge uh, each, each other in, in human ways. And, and, and that's coming. You know, I, I think, you know, we sit here in the end of 2020, turning the page of 21. And I think there's, there's reason to, there's reason to be hopeful. We have a vaccine, I think, coming and um, we, we won't, I hope, go backwards from the lessons learned in 20 and um, building on those together, making progress together. I think that's, that's something I'm, uh, I'm very hopeful for in 21. <laughs> That sounds good. That sounds good. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, okay, John, look, I have a couple more questions and then uh, some, some really quick uh, back and forth uh, questions. So look, let's, let's shift uh, a tone here a bit. Um, as I do this series, I often ask alumni um, about, um, uh, you know, uh, what excites them? What, is, what are they looking forward to and energizing them? You, you talk, you've talked about the social and cultural space, but look, not there's no intention here for you to give away any proprietary information, but what professionally and personally are you looking forward to as we move forward? Yeah, a lot, Stephen, a lot. I, I, uh, I sit here today, you know, 30 years of my career. I'm as excited as, a, as I was day, day week one. Um, in my company, you know, we believe that the best is temporary at best. Athletes show us that. As soon as a record is created, someone's right behind trying to break it. And what that means to us in design is that we keep pursuing to invite more to sports, uh, open the aperture to any athlete and every athlete anywhere in the world. Um, and there's seven and a half billion people on our planet plus, and we'd like to touch more people, invite more to sport because we know the the self-confidence and the empowerment that sport brings to our world and to individuals. So I sit here today very excited that we at Nike believe sport is a birthright for every generation. And we're gonna do everything we can to make sure that that gift is passed forward. So a couple of uh, a couple of things that we're working on in design at Nike that won't you know, give the farm away. Um, we, we are very interested in the protection of the future playground that, that is planet Earth with a series of initiatives that um, design has been responsible to help birth with uh, great partners in our company. One is uh, design circularity. We're thinking about this idea of designing from a circular perspective, which is to, uh, in essence, reclaim materiality and be able to think about unlocking fluid materials over and over and over again. So imagine a sneaker becomes a basketball, becomes a track jersey becomes a backpack, becomes a sneaker again. So I, I just believe that some of the great work that we're doing will begin to share with the world how we believe that matter will matter more by having us working in concert with our consumers. And our consumers move from being just literally consumption to becoming citizens. They participate in the commerce of moving material and reimagining material over and over and over again. I, I've been quoted and I like to say that I grew up and was trained at Penn State with one of the brilliant design adages of the last century, which was form follows function. And it was important, a Bauhausian sort of philosophy of linking utility and beauty together. I think we're at the dawn of a new age where form and function follow footprint. And that that is a constraint that will help shape the aesthetic, the beauty, the function and the utility of the future of buildings and products and services, et cetera. And I don't believe that form and function following footprint is in any way a compromise. I believe there are huge unlocks in materials and methodologies that uh, will not be uh, a reduced or diminished design or a diminished performance opportunity. So I'm really excited about that. As a bookend partner to that, I'm really excited about uh, the notion of um, an artificial intelligence being partnered with an audacious imagination of a designer. Those two AIs worked together. Oh, yes. Yeah, right? Yes. The new AI is not artificial intelligence. It's an audacious imagination. 
powered by calculus. So at Nike, we are uh, on the forefront in the, the great frontier of using the, the calculus as a partner, as a surrogate for the hard work, not the imaginative work, but the iterative work. And so I know at Penn State with some of the work you guys are doing, again, kind of groundbreaking and leveraging virtual environments and three-dimensional uh, technologies, et cetera, mm -hmm. we're there too. And we, and we believe that a designer empowered with amazing tools and technologies, the output and the fidelity of design goes higher and wider uh, and deeper all at the same time. So I, I'm really excited to see where that's going to take us as, as a brand. I think there's a unique, I'll call it aesthetic signature, but also performance uh, criteria that is on the horizon that will, I think will unlock even more potential in athletes and sports. Um, so I, I, I'm excited about, about those two as, as bookends. And I, because of that excitement, I know that we will continue to help athletes meet and exceed their own ambitions, which I think for us at, at the most elite level, and I'm lucky I get to work with the world's best athletes, they, they blaze a trail, <laughs> they pave a path of what's possible and they show us what's possible. And I look forward to seeing uh, what's possible through the world of sports. I, I can't wait to see what's going to happen. That's exciting. It really is. You've given me so much to think about. Uh, the new AI, uh, I, I'm going to have to live with that for, for a little bit. Um, I'm eager to, to chat with you in our, in our next uh, conversations that you, you and I have. We have so many different ways that we, we, we uh, uh, engage ideas. But um, wow. I, those are those are exciting uh, 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 spaces to to think about, and uh, um, I'm eager to uh, to see where they take you. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the truth is, Steve, uh, and, and it's great because I I suspect this is a, a Penn State audience. Um, you Penn Staters, uh, you're getting a great education, and you're you're being trained and you're being taught to think critically, and uh, and I can go backwards in my own. Uh, time at Penn State, and there's a handful of professors whom I still keep in touch with that um, become kind of guideposts, if you will, and, and I touch base every once in a while, and there are some of them are retired, and some are still working, actually. So enjoy that. I mean, enjoy that, that, that rigorous study. Enjoy the time. It's preparing you for a rich future. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, I'm a little biased, but I agree. Uh, and I, I would say, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier about the, the 18 year old John. Uh, sounds like that's advice that, that you would give him. Uh, that's, uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, we'll, we'll have to talk about that, that, that more too, to, to hear if, if uh, 18 year old John would have listened and taken your advice. And uh, we'll also, we could also talk later in another conversation if 18 year old Steve would have listened and taken your advice too. <laughs> so look, John, I wanna wrap this up, man, with um, just a, a quick set of questions. There, there, there are five questions, just really fast. I'm gonna share them with you. Yeah, totally. Put the answers right back to me, okay? Yep. All right, so look, you're back at Penn State. Think about Penn State campus. Uh, if it, you come back to Penn State, I take you to the creamery. What flavor are you ordering? What ice cream flavor at the creamery are you ordering? You know, I'll date myself because the last time I was there, I, I ordered the chocolate chip cookie dough. And the reason I did was because when I was a, a student, that was brand new. That was innovation at the time. <laughs> Put the cookie dough inside the vanilla ice cream. Yeah. You got yourself a franchise. That's it. Still hey. too. <laughs> Uh, you, you are dating yourself. Uh, we're, yeah. we're about this, we're the same age, so I, I get it. Uh, okay, where was the first place you lived when you were at Penn State? Oh, um, I lived in East Halls, and I lived in uh, Packer, Packer Hall. In Packer Hall, okay. In, uh, 219 Packer Hall. You still remember the, the address? The, uh... I, I do, yeah. <laughs> I love yeah, it. Sure. <laughs> uh, your favorite place in downtown State College? Oh, good question. Um, you know, I, uh, my favorite place was a place that became um, a destination for my girlfriend, now wife, um, Karen. And we used to go to uh, a little place called the Adam's Apple, which is down on Calder Way, I believe it was. Yes, it still and is. And yes. it was uh, kind of a quaint, quiet 
place to have a drink at the time. So the last time I was at Penn State, we went there and it's about the same. I think same basic drinks, same basic vernacular. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, that's your favorite place downtown. What is or what was your favorite place on campus? Uh, good, good, good question. I think this good. You know, God, I loved, I loved the Penn State campus, um, the whole thing. I, I, it was gorgeous when I was there. Um, I lived on campus, so, but I think the favorite place was the, um, I know it's changed now because the studios have moved, but it would have been the engineering units, the engineering buildings right behind Hammond. And I sort of migrated through freshman to senior year across all those buildings. And mm -hmm. Throughout my five years of change, one constant was the engineering units. Uh, that's that was the home of the arts and architecture school back then. Way back then, and they were lettered, weren't they? A, B, C, D. Is that correct? Yeah, and I think they cut off like D and E. I think those are gone. I think it's A, a B, and C is still left. I don't yeah. know who's there, but but yeah, they they lopped off a couple buildings. <laughs> uh, Two, two quick questions. Uh, as an architecture student, did you ever have time to go to a football game? I did. Yeah, I did. Especially when I was, um, our senior year was uh, the football season, 1987, when we won the, uh, the championship. So that was super fun. Got to know a couple of friends that were players. Um, but I did. And not every game, because I was busy in studio trying to do my work. But As you should be, yes. But um, I absolutely enjoyed uh, my time there. And going to that back then, we had you know pretty interesting tailgates and, and great parties and then watch the game. So that was fun. Yeah. Nice. All right, John, last question, man. Who was one person of influence for you during your time at Penn State? Man, that's tough. Um, can I give you two? You may give me two. I'd say that because um, these two people uh, were important in my life and I'd like <laughs> it's important to honor people that made a difference. The first person is um, one of the ex-deans of the school. His name was uh, Renario Cobaletti and he was the, the dean of the architecture school. Um, when I came to uh, Penn State as a freshman, I entered the program for artistic merit. Like because of my dyslexia, my entrance exams and my um, my grades were not good because I was, I am a very poor test taker. And so I had a chance to uh, enter the program on artistic merit. So have bringing a portfolio to uh, be reviewed by faculty and by the Dean, uh, Professor Corbelletti. So in my senior year in high school, uh, my father and I drove up to Penn State on a snowy day and we stayed at the Nittany Lion Inn, and I had an appointment um, with Dr. Corbelletti. And I remember it was snowing because everyone was leaving, and he, he stayed. And he invited both of us into his office, and he went through my portfolio, and uh, my father had left, and it was just the two of us. And this was an older gentleman, you know, trained as an architect and a dean, and I, I was quite nervous to be <laughs> sitting in his presence. And he was really helpful. And I don't know how we got in this conversation, but I had said to him, you know, I've been, I have got learning disabilities. That's why my test scores were so low. I fondly say that my SAT score was the calorie count on a can of Coca-Cola. So not that great. Um, and he asked me, he said, well, you know, what, what was the, what was the workaround? And I talked about drawing. I talked about being able to be somebody who could draw, you know, pretty much anyway. And he asked me about being an athlete and I talked about being an athlete. And out of the blue, he said, are you ambidextrous? And I am. I can write and draw with both my left and right hands. I, I, I do it now with my right hand because that's, that's the time what I was, was taught. And he said, I'm just curious, John, do you know what a mirror mind is? And I said, no, I don't. And he said, well, you know, the way I am in my mind works is I'm ambidextrous and I can write with both my left and right hand, but as, as a mirror back and forth. And I was like, I, I can do that. And he gave me a pen and said, show me. And he gave me another pen and said, do it for me. And so I literally said, I'll sign my name backwards and forwards. I'd never known anyone else that had had that. And I was kind of blown away. I walked out, I walked out of the interview. I didn't think I did very well. And uh, about two weeks later, I got a letter and I was admitted. And I got to know and see Dr. Corbelletti throughout my, um, you know, my five years. 
And in my fifth year, you got to pick an advisor uh, to be your thesis advisor. And Dr. Corbelletti um, never took students, ever. And I went in humbly and I asked him if he'd be my thesis advisor. And he remembered and he said, I absolutely will. And uh, he was with me for about two months then he died suddenly, he passed away uh, about halfway through our senior year. And I had a wonderful uh, other professor who, who helped me, Arthur Anderson, um, you know, move through my, my thesis. But to me, that was really interesting. And, um, and I think about that. I think about that moment of somebody, uh, a, a man of great stature, of, of great achievement, you know, helping out a young kid and, uh, and returning that favor. So I'm forever grateful for Dr. Corbelletti because I wouldn't be sitting here if it wouldn't have been for that snowy day. <laughs> I would not be sitting where I am. So that's one. And then the second one um, is a, a gentleman who was brand new in his academic career, as I remember. He just had started at Penn State. And I believe he still teaches. His name is Dr. Craig Zabel. And Dr. Zabel is in the art history. Group. Art history. That's right. He was a young, young buck when, when I was a senior. And uh, he taught modern architecture, uh, the theories of modern architecture and modern architectural history. And several of us just so enjoyed his teaching. We asked him to create a course our last semester at Penn State. And I think four or five of us in the studio took his class and a couple of grad students took his class. And he made up a class that is with me today. And the class was looking at design through the lens of the context of culture. So think music, theater, film, industrial design, interior furniture and architecture all simultaneously. And that sits with me today. That is a fully immersive um, approach to design. And, and I got a chance to say hello and thank you to Dr. Zabel when I gave a speech back at Penn State. I brought that story up and he used several great designers, Charles and Ray Eames, Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, Mies van der Rohe, uh, others uh, in the era, and brought up, you know, Michael Graves, et cetera. And it was him who put me on a path to think outside of the bounds of architecture. And so for Dr. Zabel, if you're listening, thank you so much for that semester. And thank you for opening the aperture in, in my mind. I am forever grateful. Wow. You don't necessarily know people are going to have that great an influence or an inspiration on, on your life or trajectory in the moment. But when you reflect, uh, we, we can often point, point to those people. And to have two remarkable people uh, at, at that point in, in your, uh, your studies, uh, that, that, that's something else, John. I, I will make sure that Craig Zabel uh, watches. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, thank you, Craig. And uh, I do think it's important, Stephen, as, you know, as we get on in years is to really um, appreciate and show gratitude for the people who have made a difference in your life. So, uh, so those, those two amongst many, many, many others. I can't leave it without also saying that I met my, my wife at Penn State. At, at, we were both very young and um, she has forever changed the trajectory of my life as well. For the for the absolute best, so fellow Penn Stater, uh, yeah. love of my life, etc. That's great. I, I met my wife at Penn State too. I know what that. Uh, yeah, yes, we, we, that will be the topic of one of our next conversations. How we right. meet yeah. those inspirational people uh, in in our lives. John Hoke, you are fantastic, man. Thank you so much for taking time to uh, sit down with me and uh, uh, become another. Uh, amazing conversation in this this series. Um, to know that we have uh, someone of uh, uh, you know one of one of our own art uh, arts and architecture Penn State alum doing the work that you're doing, uh, not just at Nike but in in the world. The the influence, uh, the, the the drive that you have to uh, do a little bit to help other people to make the world better. Thank you so much. Uh, we're proud of you. Thank, Thank you, John. I much appreciate it, Stephen. Thanks so much for the venue. And um, we're here to make a difference. We're here to make it better. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you.